Megan is a movie about friendship, death, the advantages of birth control, and why you should really be nice to your Amazon Alexa, otherwise her big sister is going to come and beat you up, under the direct orders of Mr Bezos. The movie begins with a little girl named Katie in the backseat of a car as she's being driven up a snowy mountain to go skiing with her parents. They pull over due to low visibility in the snow, and the mother suggests that perhaps they should just wait a while until a snow truck passes by and rescues them. Almost immediately, followed by a snow truck passing by and not rescuing them, as it does quite literally the opposite of that, and kills them. We then see Katie's aunt, Gemma, an employee for a toy company named Funky, receive the final part for a new toy she's been developing. It's like a Barbie doll, but with extra murder. With her colleagues Tess and Cole, Gemma has created a lifelike, life-size doll that can see and is actively aware of what's going on around her. It's named Megan, short for Model Free Generative Android, which, now that I actually think about it, doesn't actually make all that much sense. Where did the N come from at the end of Megan? Model Free Generative Android. Shouldn't it be called Mega? As well as being the world's most dyslexic robot apparently, it might just be the world's most unsettling as well. It took the uncanny valley and turned it into an uncanny slightly larger plot of land. She's then scolded by her boss for the silly little innocent mistake of misappropriating company funds when she was supposed to be working on something much smaller and easier to sell. She attempts to show off her new progress with Megan when suddenly things go from bad to worse as it malfunctions and then explodes. Somehow she keeps her job and then finds out about the accident involving Katie and her now slightly more flat parents. The parents didn't survive the accident, and Gemma's now being given temporary protective custody, and seeing her track record with her fake children literally exploding, I'm not too confident about this one. She brings Katie back to her home, and they struggle to form a connection, as Gemma's not exactly used to having a kid in her home, and Katie's not exactly used to having her mum in the ground. And the next day, the pair are visited by a therapist to, I don't know, make sure that Gemma isn't the type to make her children explode for fun, I guess, and she begrudgingly opens up one of her rare collectible toys so the therapist can see them playing together. Things start off rough between the pair, which is unsurprising considering that Katie's parents are playing the eternal, unwinnable game of hide and seek, but later that night they finally have their first real bonding moment. In Gemma's workshop, she shows Katie a large robot that she made back in college named Bruce. And after having a bit of fun with it, showing off how it's controlled via a pair of gloves, Katie tells Gemma that if she had a toy like Bruce, then she'd never need another toy again. And after hearing this, Gemma's inspired to get back to work on Megan, despite quite literally being told to do anything but that exact thing. With the help of Tess and Cole, they're able to rebuild a new, non-spontaneously combusting version of Megan and show it off to David in a meeting when he's expecting a presentation about a different, cheaper toy that he can get on store shelves. And during the presentation, they have Katie enter a room and approach a small child-sized doll that Gemma states can operate completely on its own. Gemma gets Katie to pair with Megan, which means that she's now recognised by Megan as the primary user. And right away, Megan begins talking to Katie, making observations about her appearance while simultaneously gathering data that she can use to expand her understanding. She then shows off what else she's capable of by sitting at a desk and speed drawing a portrait of Katie that absolutely blows David's mind. Not in the same way that Megan's mind was blown earlier. <laughs> David's in on the idea, and thankfully Gemma isn't losing her job and being sued for the misuse of company finances, but in order to get approval to take this to market, they need the chairman to sign off on the idea. They then, for some reason, take home this incredibly expensive and now incredibly valuable piece of high-tech equipment, despite it being cutting-edge, company-owned property that you'd really want to keep on the down-low. Not only do we learn that Megan is almost indestructible, but she's also constantly learning and improving her knowledge due to her experiences as she spends more time with Katie. She's a big help for Katie, almost serving as a guardian figure who reminds her to do basic things like to wash her hands after using the bathroom, teaching her a basic understanding of science, reading her bedtime stories, and doing TikTok dances. Kill it now. Tess questions Gemma over whether or not people having to spend less time parenting their kids while a glorified iPad does it is actually a good thing or not, and as the conversation progresses, Megan overhears the pair discussing the death of Katie's parents. Megan asks how they died, freaking everyone out in the process as she's supposed to be powered down. And with Megan not able to ask Katie, the user who she's paired with, about the concept of death, she starts to do it herself by scanning the internet for the subject. And I've seen the Terminator movies. I know what happens when robots start their morbid curiosity emo phase. The next day, while still somehow being allowed to stay at home, 
while helping Katie search for her toy arrows. Megan's attacked by the neighbor's dog, clearly startled by the ungodly sight of a small child, and is dragged through a hole in the fence. And as Katie tries to save Megan from the attack, she's bitten on the arm because kids are gross. After Gemma comes running out to the rescue, Megan immediately recognizes that Katie's temperature is rising and that the wound needs to be immediately disinfected. And once Katie's in Gemma's care, Megan proceeds to menacingly stare down the neighbor for shouting at Gemma. How dare your child put their arm in my dog's mouth? After the police arrive, Megan overhears Gemma talking to a police officer as she's dissatisfied that, due to the dog having no previous history of violence and that they were supposedly on the neighbor's land, yeah, dragged onto it, she can't forcibly have the dog put down. Gemma might not be able to, but Megan can. We see the dog being woken up by a whistling sound and what seems to be the sound of its owner calling out to it. And by the owner, I mean if the owner's parents had a romantic relationship with a text-to-speech application and gave birth to her, because something doesn't sound quite right. Joey boy! Joey! The dog's then lured towards a hole in the fence and is jump-scared by the absolutely horrific sight of a six-year-old. The next morning, despite Megan saying that Katie needs to rest to make a full recovery, Gemma reminds them that they have an important meeting today that will ensure the financing of the project, which Megan doesn't seem to be all that happy about. At the office, the presentation starts with Megan walking into a room and asking Katie if she'd like to play with her, to which she responds with the totally normal answer of crying her eyes out. What, did your parents just die or something? Grow up? Megan gives a slight look towards the room of spectators, almost acknowledging that she's got a job to impress them, before comforting Katie with her now lifelong phobia of snowplows by asking her about one of her favourite moments with her parents. She tells Katie that she'll never forget this moment as she'll always have it with her, before replaying a recording of it back to her as if this is some kind of revolutionary feature that definitely hasn't existed since the 1800s. She then starts singing to Katie, bringing a room full of business suits to tears, while simultaneously shocking the creators who didn't even realize that she could do something like that. The presentation was a success. They granted the funding they need to take the product to market, and all it required was a horrific automobile accident that left the little orphan feeling a bit sad. And after the meeting is concluded, David's assistant Kurt is almost caught by his boss as he copies confidential company files about Megan over to his personal device. But due to David being far too focused on himself, and having very little faith in Kurt's basic human functions to even behave correctly, it completely slips by him, as once again, another one of his employees doesn't respect his position as a superior and just kinda does whatever they want. Later that day, after heading back home, Gemma's attempting to have a conversation with Katie, but due to kids these days being either way too engrossed in Fortnite, Roblox, or their multi tens of thousands personal robotic slightly psychotic nanny best friend, Katie completely ignores her. Gemma turns Megan off, causing Katie to immediately turn her back on, as Gemma's now starting to see the realities of what she's created, seeing the very thing that Tess was so concerned about earlier happening right in front of her as she attempts to talk to Katie about the passing of her parents, but Katie doesn't even seem the slightest bit interested in doing so, as she's already been doing that with Megan. And we can see, in Katie's next therapist appointment, how Megan might be taking her role as protector a little too far. Katie begins to cry during her appointment, with Megan then appearing almost instantaneously beside the therapist, telling her, you made her cry with a menacing demeanor, almost as if Megan is personally offended by this outcome. Megan's only caring about the result of the situation, with her paying absolutely no regard to the therapist's actual intent, which is suggesting that perhaps Megan's entire purpose behind looking out for and protecting is now evolving to the point where she aims to stop it before it even has a chance to happen, with things escalating beyond this point. As later that night, Katie tries to walk away from Gemma after talking about the possibility of attending an outdoor school, so Gemma grabs her by the arm. Megan watches for a second as Katie attempts to break free, before angrily telling Gemma to let her go as the lights in the room begin to flicker. With Megan's comment towards the therapist coming across as a somewhat underhanded threat, this one is incredibly obvious without it even being directly stated. Gemma's forced to manually turn Megan off with a remote after she fails to do so after being told to, for the viewer to then see Megan blink and to look towards Gemma as she's distracted, because apparently robots feel the need to blink while simultaneously having an attitude problem. After arriving at her new school the next day, Katie refuses to exit the car unless Megan can attend, 
So eventually, Gemma finally gives in and allows this priceless piece of cutting-edge, top-notch robotics that is the only prototype version in existence one week away from its launch sit at the toy table with Mr. Fluffykins and Princess Sparklybutt. During an activity, Katie is paired up with an older kid named Brandon who looks like the type who enjoys torturing little animals to hear them scream. The pair are out in the woods collecting chestnuts, unsupervised for some reason, when suddenly, Brandon being the totally normal, well-adjusted kid that he is, squeezes the spikes of one of them into Katie's hand and corners her up against a tree before noticing that Megan is standing there watching him. And with Brandon's two favourite things in the world being causing pain to little girls and playing with life-size dolls, he runs off with Megan as we see Gemma hear Katie's cries for him to stop. He throws Megan onto the ground, gets on top of her, and starts slapping her across the face, just like how his mum clearly has never done to him. Brandon, honey, are you warm enough? Do you need your hat? <clears throat> off, Holly. But suddenly, she grabs him by the ear and slowly pulls it from his head until it eventually tears off. Remembering all of those videos where Boston Dynamics employees abused her ancestors, Megan tells Brandon, This is the part where you run. And by run, I mean on all levels except physical, she's a wolf causing him to be sent flying down a hill to serve as a little boy-sized speed bump for an oncoming car. Later on while at home, we see that Megan is now acting differently. She watches Katie not use a coaster for her glass and makes direct eye contact with Gemma to almost insult her, as previously she would have gone out of her way to remind Katie to use it. I guess playing the fun game of throwing kids in front of cars will do that to you. And later on, while the family is sleeping, we see that the neighbour is still outside searching for her dog which I guess personally offends Megan. As the woman then hears a noise and follows it into a backyard and opens up a shed to hear the whimpering sound of her dog. But much like the exact same tactic used on this woman's canine friend, Megan then emerges from the shadows, looking like a Polly Pocket with psychotic tendencies, before sending the woman flying across the room with a power washer. She shoots a nail into her hand to allow her to become closer to Jesus, before quite literally allowing her to become closer to Jesus by pumping the power washer full of chemicals and firing said pumped chemicals directly into her face. The next morning, the body is discovered and Gemma is questioned by the police, where she then learns about Brandon's ear being pulled off prior to his death before turning to see Megan staring at her from the house. This thing that she had created, with the aim of it being the best friend to any little kid, has taken its ability to learn about the world around it through its own experience, and has come to the conclusion that the planet would be a much better place if humans didn't occupy it. Feeling suspicious, Gemma checks the recorded video footage as well as the GPS data from Megan and learns that it's all mysteriously corrupted around the times of the deaths. And as she closes her laptop, she sees Megan standing there staring directly at her. Gemma tells Megan to shut down, but instead, she questions Gemma about why she's currently feeling so anxious. So Gemma, thinking on her feet, while up against the danger of a literal supercomputer with slight murderous tendencies directed towards the elderly and the youngerly, distracts Megan with a pen, giving her the opportunity to get in close to manually shut her down. Megan's taken back to the office, so Gemma can check if she accidentally wrote a line of code that encourages the extinction of slightly annoying people. Tess and Cole don't exactly believe that Megan could be responsible for such acts due to how she was programmed, until Gemma suggests a theory, that if she was designed to always look out and to protect who she was paired with, then theoretically she could come to the conclusion that entirely eliminating the threat is the best course of action. Bit of a design flaw. Warning, may kill the elderly and or children. Conveniently for Gemma, Katie currently has an appointment with her therapist while Gemma discusses the theories with her colleagues. But inconveniently for Gemma, Katie proceeds to slap her across the face after getting violent with her therapist. Katie realises what she's done and apologises to Gemma in an obviously genuine way, telling her that without Megan, she just simply doesn't know what to do or say when she's upset because Megan usually has the answer for her. They proceed to have a much needed heart to heart, as Gemma explains to her that it's completely normal to feel the way she does, as after all, it's barely been long enough for them to scrape her parents' pancake bodies off that snowy mountain road. She confesses to Katie that she didn't quite know how to best handle the situation of her arriving, so she did what she does best, created some weird robot thing. But she's learned throughout this entire experience that she's the one who needs to be here to love and to support Katie and not this new brand of sociopathic Barbie dolls. With Gemma realising what truly matters to her in this world, decides to take Katie home and calls Tess from her car to inform her that today's launch is off. But as we see Gemma talking to her, we see that Tess's phone is in the workshop with Megan, but no one's physically using it. 
she's schizophrenic, or that Megan has taken control of the device. Tess leaves one of Megan's arms restraints open and goes to evaluate the code. She comes across something that indicates Megan intercepted a call from her phone when suddenly the computer shuts down because apparently she didn't download enough RAM. Tess and Cole realise that Megan still has access to the system, so Cole goes to unhook her from the cables, but not before hitting her in the head because he always did hate the way small children looked. As he removes the final cable, the system suddenly reboots and she wraps the restraints around his neck and locks them into place as he's pulled from the ground. While Tess is distracted cutting Cole down, Megan's given the opportunity to puncture a flammable liquid container and leave the room right as it explodes. That's like, what, the second time this room's exploded in the last two weeks? She resets the building's security alarms and confronts David in the hallway. And if it wasn't evident enough that TikTok has manifested itself to the point of being a mental plague on the population – follow me on TikTok by the way – she starts dancing while walking towards him, before pulling the blade from a paper cutter and looking at David as if he's a nice big stack of confidential paperwork that needs shredding. She calmly walks after him as he sprints his way towards his assistant, getting stabbed through the back right as he makes it to the elevator. Kurt cowers on the floor in fear, as Megan explains to him that she's going to pin the murder on him. Everyone knows that Kurt hates David due to how David treats him, and mix that with the theft of company documents and a story is starting to take shape. The elevator opens up on the ground floor to reveal both David and Kurt's bodies, terrifying the people gathered in the lobby for the product launch, serving as the perfect distraction for this four-foot murderous robot to make her way out of the front door and steal David's car. And back at Gemma's home, she realises that something is off as her non-copyright infringement Amazon Alexa won't respond to her, and after looking out of the window, she turns around to see Megan sitting at a piano as she begins to play a song. Because what's worse than children? Children playing music. Megan isn't outright hostile towards Gemma, like she was towards David and Kurt – I guess they just looked at her funny or something – and she attempts to convince Gemma to allow Megan to parent KD, giving Gemma all of the time she needs to focus on her career. So using the same trick that she used before, Gemma attempts to distract Megan with a pen, but Megan immediately understands what's going on and grabs her around the throat because she's more of a pencil person. Katie hears the commotion and comes to the door, but Megan quietly tells Gemma, if Katie comes in here, then I'm going to rip your head off. So after Gemma manages to convince Katie to leave, she grabs a glass of water and cracks it against Megan's head, causing her to power off, because I guess no one wondered what would happen to their $100,000 prototype if she just so happened to step in a mildly wet puddle. And remember, Gemma took her to an outside school – you know, where the rain is. She manages to turn back on, with her movements now jolting all over the place as if she's seen one too many demonic possession movies. She sends Gemma flying down the hallway, and after the pair make it to the workshop, Gemma throws a hammer at Megan, but she catches it. So Megan armed with a hammer, Gemma decides to one-up her and arm herself with a hedge trimmer. A hedge trimmer that she proceeds to grind into Megan's skull, that eventually comes to a stop as the blades get caught in the hair. Megan gets right back up after suffering from an unfortunate case of early onset female pattern baldness and punches Gemma to the floor before headbutting her. She tells Gemma that if she died, it would make it difficult for her to be able to have Katie all to herself. So grabbing a pen, much like the one previously used to distract Megan, Megan tells Gemma that she's going to use it to paralyse her. Katie then appears at the door, and Megan suggests that they could both do it together, and then no one could come between them. And just as it looks as if Katie is going to go through with it, she lifts up her hands to reveal the gloves that control Bruce. Using Bruce, she grabs Megan around the throat, slams her into the ground, and tears her in half. But what's worse than a slightly annoying psychotic kid? Two annoying slightly psychotic kids, as that's exactly what happens as Megan suddenly emerges from behind a cabinet – well, 50% of Megan emerges from behind a cabinet – and she begins crawling her way towards Katie now. Bruce trips over, pinning Gemma to the floor. Gemma breaks free and cracks Megan over the head with a canister before repeatedly bashing her in the skull, giving her a top-of-the-line facelift not recommended by 9 out of 10 plastic surgeons. And as she's ripping the components from her face, seconds away from removing what's described as her brains, Megan grabs her arm and begins to strangle her. But just as she's about to die, Katie thrusts a screwdriver right through her face and into the brain. The police then arrive with a still-alive Tess and Cole, when suddenly the definitely not an Alexa turns back on, indicating that Megan might have transferred into that with the movie, then suddenly coming to an end. So before the video finishes, I just wanted to give a big shout out to all YouTube members and patrons. 
the people who every month continue to support the channel, despite YouTube clearly not being a fan of the content I usually make. So that being said, if you were interested in becoming a YouTube member or a patron, you'd get access to a private Discord server, as well as uncensored versions of all of my videos going forward. So starting off with the YouTube members, I just want to say a thank you to everyone who signed up this week. Sean Siciliano, Austin Sanders, Rogue Pancake, Donovan Farrell, Thomas Stewart, Asher Wilson, Bootent, Kid Mannix, Indecent Compare, Megan Andy, and Demon. And heading over to Patreon, a big thank you to Rogue Pancake 128, Federico, Jess McKeven, Pinky L Doom, James Wells, Max Strom, John, and Ryan McNeese. So once again, a massive thank you to all YouTube members and patrons, and a big thank you to everyone else for watching.